Thank you very much, Pauline. Now we can start. <laughs> so, we'll start with the um, researchers presenting, the PhD researchers presenting uh, the, the ongoing work. And we'll start with the work package one. I am in work package 1.1. So my, uh, my topic is the discourse of the circular economy and its policies. Um, looking at the conceptual side of it and then applying a conceptual lens in a few case studies. Uh, so I'll be brief because most of you guys know really well what I'm doing. The re other people that are uh, that haven't um, listened to what we've been, or what I've been doing, uh, I'll present it in more detail uh, in Wednesday when I present my paper. And uh, so I'll go briefly through basically my work plan and uh, what what, uh, what I've done so far. Uh, so this is basically. Uh, diagram of like um, my three, four years actually of uh, PhD. And uh, so now we're exactly after one year. And uh, basically we, uh, well I've finished or worked on mostly two draft papers or three draft papers. The first one is a conceptual review of the circular economy, looking towards the creation of a typology of circular economy discourses and understanding the complexity of different visions of circularity that are within academia, because it's very complex. There are a lot of different visions and no one is really um, uh, agreeing on, on exactly where it should go and what it means. The second one uh, applies this conceptual view to the EU uh, and uh, looks at uh, basically the EU discourse and the EU laws and legislations and how they uh, portray the circular economy and what position on it and what vision of circularity they propose. Uh, and then uh, I've also been working with my colleagues Kieran and Kaustop, which are also in work package one, on a paper on tires in the Netherlands. Uh, which looks at the circularity of uh, basically the sector of tire recycling and the extended producer responsibility system that is set up for it within the Netherlands. Uh, now, um, luckily all three papers are quite well advanced. I will present the conceptual one, which is uh, uh, the more theory-based one, of course, in, uh, on Wednesday in more detail, and uh, I'm happy to discuss the rest with you, because uh, in 10 minutes there's definitely, I can't go through uh, the findings of all of them. Um, Basically, uh, in, uh, during the summer, I was able to do two summer schools and one workshop in China where we all went. Uh, and uh, basically, this allowed the methodology for the rest of the three years to, to evolve and be established. And uh, I'm going to be working in the Netherlands and the UK to compare plastic circular economy governance and implementation and discourse, basically. Uh, in, um, in, the in the next year, basically, and then in the year after that, I'll be looking at another sector or material flow, uh, most probably textiles, but that will be determined as time goes, uh, as I have an industry partner called RAP, uh, that uh, is our uh, second ment, basically, and uh, we're working closely with them, so it really depends on what they will be focused on. Right now, they're basically focused on plastics through the UK plastic campaign, so that's why I'm working with them on plastics first, uh, and looking at the discourse, the policies, and the way forwards, both, both from the government side and from uh, civil society and, uh, and the private sector. Um, yeah, so basically that's, uh, yeah, I, I wanna be brief because there, there'll be more time to get into the details of the, the rest. Uh, and um, I, um, yeah, I pass on to my colleagues. I can repeat the question. Uh, he asked whether I went, what summer schools I did. Uh, so I did two summer schools basically. One on behavioral operational research. Uh, that was in Nijmegen, it was really nice. Uh, and uh, the other one was in Futuring for Sustainability. Also very nice, mostly related to methods. So I learned quite a lot of transdisciplinary method techniques and interview methods to do um, 
mental mapping and uh, casual flow diagrams and uh, basically a lot of transdisciplinary research uh, approaches and and that actually was very useful for me to do the, the the methods that I will apply later on for the case studies. Uh, yes, uh, Anna. Or yes, uh, Anna. Please use this. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering from these summer schools, what were your main takeaways for you personally? Like, what changed? What changed uh, after you went to those summer schools for your methods section? Well, one thing that was really interesting, perhaps, was in the futuring summer school. Uh, in uh, there, basically, futuring is used as an approach not to like actually forecast or, or, or try to see what's going to happen in the future, but rather as a method to understand discourse, understand like the actual like how people think about circular economy. So by making people imagine like the future of circularity, rather than understanding what it will be, because really it's impossible to predict the future, it's 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 a very good tool to establish what people actually. What are their imaginaries regarding circularity? And, and, and that was super interesting. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting work about like how to create futuring techniques with people and stuff. Um, and, and then in the behavioral operational research, it was much more kind of practical methods. So I learned really good interview techniques that I, would, that I could share with you guys that, that I think were really, really uh, interesting to create a cognitive mapping of like um, basically of imaginaries for sustainability. Have you received any uh, recognitions, awards, anything <laughs> in this time? <laughs> well, it's funny you ask, Santi, because you received one as well. <laughs> that was Walter's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, Santi and I did uh, receive a presentation award in, in China when we presented our research. <laughs> More questions? Oh. No? So let's move on. Oh, okay. Thanks very much for that introduction to your, to your work. Um, are you noticing how you might be able to uh, look at kind of thinking about circular economy principles according to uh, age groups? We hear a lot about how the younger people in particular are buying into to that. Do you, do you think it's worth um, exploring that more and seeing, seeing how that can be analyzed in some ways? And that's my first question. Second question, I suppose, is from what you've found so far, are you increasingly optimistic about circularity or pessimistic or undecided yet? Um, regarding age groups, I, I, don't, I haven't researched that, so um, I think it definitely is a gap within the knowledge uh, that deserves to be investigated. Uh, I'm looking more at social sectors in general, uh, civil society, private and public mainly, or social groups. Uh, so I, I don't really segregate by age in that sense. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it deserves attention regarding my, my optimism or, or skepticism about the circular economy. I, I think right now the concept, uh, as a few authors have pointed out, is in a time of a validity challenge. So it means that it basically, uh, it, it can either become something transformative or it could become a new form of greenwashing or uh, uh, basically just disappear and new old concepts will emerge. Um, and uh, I think depending on how it's implemented by governments, how companies undertake it, and whether it actually leads to positive sustainability outcomes, and, and by that not only environmental ones but also socially inclusive ones, it, I think will really determine what, what, what it, whether it goes one or the other way. Unfortunately, so far, very often, companies and governments have taken an approach that don't always push towards a more transformative potential of the concept, uh, and have taken it, uh, yeah, not, not, not in the most, I would say, inclusive way. Uh, but but it still remains to be said whether it will go in, in one or the other direction and, uh, and, and, and predicting the future is, uh, no, it's, yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. I'll just read you one phrase which may push you towards optimism. With the, with the new European Green Deal, Commission President-elect Ursula von der Leyen has put environment and climate at the top of the political agenda. The goals include carbon neutrality by 2050, leadership in circular economy and clean technologies, a new biodiversity strategy for 2020, a reduction in emissions of reduction, uh, 55% by 2030, and the drive towards zero pollution. Mm. And the LIFE research program with, I think, $100 million or euros uh, is devoted to that. So I think you can expect to see that there will be a, a rush also by industry towards these solutions. Uh, sh uh, should I answer? <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. <laughs> no, yeah. thanks for no thanks. I, I I had seen I actually had seen Ursula von Leyen's uh, uh, presentation to the to the Parliament. So I mean I hope they I hope that actually translates into action because of course so far she's not there and she has to agree with a lot of other commissioners and 28 member states. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really hope it translates. I think you know better than I, uh, you know, the insides of European policy making. <laughs> and if you're optimist about it, that uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Martin. Uh, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> the second present presenter, um, from also from Work Packet One, Kieran, please. The floor is yours. If you manage to present in 10 minutes, we can have some time for discussions. Cool. So. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Kieran Campbell Johnston. I'm in Web Package 1, uh, 1.2 with Walter and Sabrina. Uh, broadly, my topic is uh, building on Martin's, examining uh, existing policies and practices, particularly around the organization and performance of uh, recycling systems in different European countries, uh, Italy, France, uh, and the Netherlands. Um, so broadly, the overview of the presentation quickly will be initial activities, um, our secondment experiences, um, external collaboration, uh, the first year challenges, and the next steps. Um, so to kind of give an overview of the, the stuff I've been doing so far, uh, we of course had to finish our, our research proposals, which was done in uh, January, just uh, before the Utrecht uh, cresting meeting. Uh, secondly, I had my uh, secondment with Rex Vaterstadt, who are also based in Utrecht. And there I was working with um, the waste and materials department, uh, looking at the kind of policies and practices uh, in the Netherlands. And the kind of broad outcomes for this year uh, so far had been um, a paper, um, the, a review of the, the cascading principle, which I'm gonna use as a key principle um, in my research. And I think we'll be talking about that uh, hopefully on Wednesday. And then, as Martin already mentioned, um, a, a paper looking at extended produced responsibility. So uh, looking at these older kind of types of circular economy-like policies and practices and using the example of tires in the Netherlands to explore um, some of the current organizational challenges and, and problems of, of existing circular economy systems um, and reflecting on how they can maybe be altered or changed to uh, be more effective. Uh, but of course, it wasn't just uh, kind of research activities. I was pretty fortunate. I had my first article published this year, um, which was really exciting. And uh, Tomas uh, helped me uh, through the submission process because he works at the Includer Production. Um, always helps to know the editor, I found. Uh, this is a little bit <laughs> pixelated. But of course, we had our first ISDRS conference in, uh, in Nanjing in China. Um, and the, the PhD workshop was uh, I know, a really nice chance for us uh, early stage researchers to like, show our, our progress and learn from each other, which um, particularly at the start I found was a really useful kind of experience. Um, and then again, a few of us went to Beijing to the industrial ecology um, conference as well and managed to see the Great Wall um, and also enjoy some beer along the way. <laughs> Um, and moving on to my uh, secondment experience, so I had 
um, three months kind of temporarily placed in the Rijkswaterstaat in Utrecht. Um, so the Rijkswaterstaat is the kind of executive body for the Dutch ministry and the, the sub-department I was in was looking at uh, the waste and materials department, so the, the monitoring and the, the policy body for, that gives them um, advice to the Dutch government. Um, and really wanted to use this uh, exploratory period really to um, understand the system, make connections with the, the key actors, the key policy makers, um, and locate kind of potential research subjects for the coming years. Um, and hopefully this will to lead some, to uh, something else. Um, this isn't really uh, related to my project, but I thought I'd use the opportunity to promote uh, a project I've also been working on uh, on the side. Um, there's a bit of a kind of housing crisis in Amsterdam at the moment, and um, uh, a group of um, kind of former squatters, uh, some academics from the University of Amsterdam, and uh, some architects were, yeah, we decided to submit an application for a, a housing project uh, in Amsterdam East. Um, and the basis idea of the project was to design a house uh, in collaboration with um, residents uh, around the kind of principles of circular economy, but also uh, the governance of the commons, so using common space. Um, and this is pretty exciting. We, just as a self-promotion, we managed to win the, the application. So now we have to raise 7 million euros to, to build a house. So uh, maybe this is a, a call if anyone fancies um, pitching in, that would be, be great. Um, some issues and challenges. Um, I kind of, firstly, was building on um, our kind of transdisciplinary kind of discussions earlier. It's this kind of debate between something that's theoretically interesting and, and practically relevant, and I've kind of really struggled with how to do something that's kind of academically relevant, but also try and do it in a way that can really be talked to stakeholders or to policy advice, um, and that's something yeah, I'm always looking for kind of advice and support with. Um, kind of connected to that, I think, maybe this issue of credibility. So um, speaking with people who have been really active in this field and actually having some credibility to kind of speak with them um, and actually kind of claim knowledge and be kind of a part of this conversation. Um, and finally, Brexit, but I don't think I need to explain why that's kind of troubling. Um, so my, my next steps for this year, so I'm going to be using my second year primarily for field research. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm looking at the kind of existing policies, governance, uh, organization around uh, the kind of recycling structures. So um, this will include field research in my host universities of Troyes and Messina um, through to 2020. And the kind of the broad research projects I'm working on is firstly a comparative piece looking at the different organizational structures of different countries in terms of their, their policy approaches. Um, and then secondly, maybe, and Costa can potentially explain this more, um, looking at uh, the post-collection uses and the issues around uh, e-waste um, in several European countries. Uh, I think Costa can speak to that much better than I. And then just some personal training. Um, language and some life cycle assessment trainings as well. Thank you. It's really uh, pixelated. Thank you, Kieran. Thanks. Questions? Um, what kind of LCA training are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there's a group at Prey Consultants in um, Armorsport in the Netherlands, and they just kind of do an introduction to the methodology. Mm -hmm. um, I think SEMA Pro software. Pro, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's something that's not really related to my project, but I'd really like to learn okay. a little bit more about it. So I was glad that you mentioned the Commons. It's really interesting. Uh, kind of touches on my area of research on cities. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, when you think about the circular economy, uh, do you think property ownership, property rights is an important issue? Is that something you're, you're starting to think about in your research? I, not kind of explicitly. I mm. think with the, the housing project that was m much more kind of focused on that. Mm. I think um, maybe some of the discussions around kind of um, product service systems and service models, there's not really an explicit conversation or that I've seen maybe about 
ownership and kind of social participation. So uh, I don't know all the literature, obviously, but I definitely feel that's something that needs to be kind of looked at maybe in more depth. Um, maybe touching what Martin said about kind of inclusiveness and who's really going to be included and benefiting from certain kind of processes is, is definitely a really important aspect. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Just to very swiftly follow up on that, I can send you a paper that does talk about ownership and how that impacts on the recovery and reuse of materials because the different, the previous owners as well as potentially the current owners have got a, a vested interest and a duty of care for what happens to materials. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? So let's move on. Thank you very much, Kieran. <laughs> let's move on. Still, still in work package one. Um, Kastub Tapa, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kostov, and I'm working. I'm in the third group of the work package one, and I looked at, at the leakages in the circular economy. By that, I mean all the waste that might leak from European Union to outside of the European Union. Uh, it, so, uh, in this presentation, I'll, I'll talk about what I did since the last workshop, but also talk about Electronic waste in a global, local, and a regional level. I'll talk about transboundary e-waste a bit, and then uh, somehow tie it to circular economy. As you can see in the map, the, the northern part, and the green countries are called the exporting countries, and the uh, brown countries are the receiving countries, according to one of the studies. Uh, I'm focusing on electronic waste in this uh, period of my research because as you can see in the graph, the, uh, most of the electric, uh, electronics are increasing and GDP growth uh, uh, globally, urbanization, uh, cheaper prices of electronic goods, they are all, all contributing to this problem. So uh, electronic waste is one of the fastest growing waste streams and it's also being exported, not in the form of waste, but use electronics from European Union to different parts of the world. So uh, that's my focus this time. Uh, brief uh, overview, we produced about 44.7 million tons of electronic waste in 2016, which is about 125,000 jumbo jets, and according to the study, we only managed 20% of the electronic waste properly. The other portion of uh, waste as, a, as, a, as the planet, it's 80% is not managed properly. Europe does a good job of collecting about 35%. And if you look at the value of electronic waste, that's about 55 billion uh, euros annually. And electronic waste is interesting because it is uh, toxic, because it has mercury, lead, and all the chemicals used for, uh, to reduce the flame. But also it has gold and copper and nickel, which are quite valuable. So my approach to this research has been a transdisciplinary approach. So it is a very method-driven, and I want to integrate different kinds of knowledges and different kind of stakeholders together so that I can have an understanding that, uh, towards solving the problem. Um, and it has, uh, and obviously I'm doing this research because European Union adopted circular economy, and uh, I like uh, Professor Walters. Uh, 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 thought about to maintain the value and utility as high as possible. So when I look at electronic waste, I use electronic, so I think how can my research maintain the value and utility for as long as possible? And I also use Walter's 10-hour uh, uh, principles to guide my research. So uh, for the first phase of my research, I went to China for two months in June and July. This is a bit of hiking I did. I I put this picture here because that's how the government of China really, I, I felt, wanted to show country because I wanted to explore all these 
uh, e-waste recycling facilities, but I did not, did not have access. So I, I could only access to the conferences and then through conferences to uh, professors, academics, research institutions, and um, recycling plants, but I could not have access to most of the things I liked, so it's the pretty picture of China that the Chinese government mostly wants to portray for foreign researchers. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is uh, China has a huge sector of informal waste workers, like most countries in maybe in the global south. They engage a lot in repair, refurbishment, repurposing before disposing. So they're already adding value to discarded waste. So for me, it seemed like they are indeed the drivers of circularity, in, if we uh, talk in a global sense. But sadly, they are exposed to health hazards, and uh, the practice really is polluting to the environment. And uh, also, I could not get a lot of data uh, uh, about electronic waste because the government told me, oh, we banned it since six years ago, seven years ago, and we don't import anything. So um, there was literally no quantitative, quantitative data. But in Nigeria, it was a bit different case. I, after China, I went to Nigeria for a month, uh, August and September. And uh, there was a f study a few years ago in Nigeria that said about 71,000 tons of uh, ele used electronics came to Nigeria in 2016 and 17, and about 77% of them were from the European Union, and a lot of them, are from, depending on the products you look at, five to 60 percent uh, actually did not work. So the electronic waste disguised as used electronics. So this gave me the ground to go to Nigeria and to see what is going on. But again, with electronic waste, that finding data is very hard. Uh, another problem is the pre uh, presence of informal sector, not problem, but also a solution. So in Nigeria, there's the huge sector of people working with the used computers. They repair, they refurbish, they cannibalize the product, and finally it's disposed mostly in a very unsafe way. And these people usually uh, don't make more than 1.25 US dollars a day, which is below the poverty line, and they live in a very uh, poor health conditions. Uh, so based on this to study, uh, uh, Walter and I, we came this up with this idea of not just extended producer responsibility, but full producer responsibility. So in the framework of full producer responsibility, we incorporate uh, even the geographic reasons and uh, somehow make the corporation responsible for uh, electronics not despite the boundaries. Uh, so. Uh, I'll skip this one. And uh, some of the highlights during the last workshop, I finished my proposal in June. I've been working on a paper recently since I moved back from Nigeria. It's the framework for full producer responsibility. And uh, I'm working in a paper like Kirian and Martin mentioned, a group paper on recycling, tire recycling. I attended three conferences, two in China and one in Ibadan, and uh, these are some of the pictures. Uh, most, uh, the three, yeah, one, one in, presenting at a conference, others during field work. Uh, and uh, my next steps is, uh, uh, my trip to China was not successful in terms of finding data uh, or making relationship for further transdisciplinary work. So I need to figure out where the plastic from European Union goes now so I can collaborate with uh, Kurian and Martin around plastic research. I'm going to Hull right after this workshop, so I'll be working with Pauline for about a month. Uh, I'll be working on building this framework for full producer responsibility and uh, also, next year I'm heading back to Nigeria again for a couple of months, and I'm also part of organizing a member of the Circularity Africa in May 2020, so if anybody wants to join the conference, please let me know. Uh, and I'll also be working with European partners, stakeholders, to see what happens before the waste leaves Europe.
And uh, that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Castro. We still have some time for questions. Kieran. Hey, uh, th thanks for your question. Um, did, you know, you, I think you mentioned that there's around 55 billion euros worth of e-waste that's kind of leaked mm -hmm. each year. How is that kind of calculated? Is that like the, the metals in there or? So it's, it's the metal that you recover from the electronic waste, but also the cost of processing the electronic waste. So it's not just recovery, but to properly manage the waste and the employment it creates. So if you add all that up, it was uh, to about 55 billion euros. Thank you. And yeah. maybe just a second question. Uh, are you still going to use the term uh, leakages? Because uh, I, I think there was kind of discussions in China that you know, there's kind of dual collaboration between a lot of these kind of receiving country, uh, countries. So is, are you still going to kind of build on that term? Yes, uh, I, I, I think I'll use, still use the term leakages because that's how it has been introduced in the literature for so long. But I'll put a critical eye to it because when I first went to China and Nigeria, I thought, oh, it's just injustice. But in, uh, my findings were it was more than injustice, uh, exporting harm, as they say. It's more about driving the economy. So uh, leak cases, but with a quotation. Yeah. And to explain, it should not be called leak cases, or leak cases in the sense of leak cases from European circularity, because they are leaking the resources to other countries. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned the concept of producer responsibility, even full producer responsibility. So with respect to the nine R's, do you see room for or even the need for consumer responsibility? A consumer's responsibility? Consumer responsibility as a um, kind of supporting act. Oh, that, that's, I never thought about this, but that's a, that's a good thing. I think if you buy a phone, make it last five years instead of two, that's, that could be, but uh, I, I have to think about it. I never thought about producer's responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to explain it very briefly, there's the purchase decision, yes. which is usually taken by a consumer. Yeah. The way how you use a product, if yes. it's an electronic product or a, a plastic bottle or whatever, yeah, sure. and what you do afterwards. afterwards yeah. So yeah. there are three, at least three entrances yeah. to consumer responsibility in this yes. context. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Kastu, for your thank presentation. You. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. My name is uh, Tomas Santamaria, for those who don't know me. Uh, I'm ESR 2.1, uh, we're package two, uh, now we're changing topics. Uh, it's around corporate engagement within the circular economy. And the focus of my uh, research uh, so far, uh, it's on circular business model you know, innovation or business model innovation for the circular economy. Um, it's a brief outline uh, following the recommended guidelines. <laughs> a little bit of uh, my update on my research, my experience on second mens, uh, some of the challenges I've had so far, uh, and maybe I mention on potential collaborations. And, my, and dissemination, which in my case is not so much. <laughs> um, just this is kind of like the overall view of um, the three research projects I'm working on and are the, the core of my uh, of my PhD for the moment. Um, one is a systematic uh, lead review on the topic of business model innovation for the circular economy which has been the focus on the last few months, along with the, ex the expose. Um, second, uh, I'm doing a series of uh, case studies uh, on, on companies, on incumbent companies that have already implemented some sort of business model innovation for the circular economy. So I did a work around and to find those companies and start contacting them, already doing a, a lot of interviews, and I'm working on, on analyzing the, the results. Uh, and third, I'm developing some uh, workshops that aim at uh, helping companies on, on the process of business model innovation for the circular economy. 
Um, and on that, those workshops is something I'm doing more recently. I'm using the design thinking as a, as a overall uh, methodology, so I'm going to be very interested in what we see in the rest of the week. Um, we are gonna, I'm going to talk in much more detail uh, on the combination of the first two projects, the, re the lead review and the case studies on, on Wednesday. So there I'm going to stop more in detail on that. So maybe just very quickly, uh, does the, the systematic review follow up general process of, uh, uh, of, um, of any systematic review, starting with a search string on the database and through so guidelines uh, and requirements, filter those uh, those papers, having a final selection, and then doing a, a cross-reference search. I identified 54 papers I reviewed for this uh, a systematic review. Uh, those papers, then I started ordering them uh, along <laughs> all the concepts that here are not being readable, but it's just the idea. Uh, how in-depth each of those papers touch it on each of these topics. And my idea was to build a, a framework that kind of like summarizes the whole uh, research, the academic research on uh, business model innovation for the circular economy. And those were the emerging topics that were actually appearing on the left. And so I built it on uh, the literature on traditional business model innovation. I reviewed a lot of that literature, consolidated some frameworks, and translated that into circular business model innovation. And that's a little bit how my framework is looking at the moment, and I'm going to talk about more about this on, on, on Wednesday. Um, that's on one side. Then I'm doing these multiple case studies. Uh, so far I have uh, selected 11 companies between uh, Austria and the Netherlands, uh, incumbent large companies, most of them, some are SMEs, I'm trying to include also, um, that implemented some, some, innova some interesting innovations, hopefully more radical. And I'm interviewing them and analyzing those cases to, to see how was the process of, of the innovation since the ideation to implement it, all the way to the implementation, uh, trying to understand how it really works in the, in the practice. And so yeah, to date, now out of 11 cases have been interviewed, uh, seven of them have been transcribed and two have been uh, coded. So I'm on an ongoing work on, on the topic. And lastly, my, the, the third uh, project is on these workshops. It's mixing two uh, large uh, frameworks, ideas. One is using design thinking as a general methodology and combining it with uh, the framework for strong sustainable development, or that's now it's been more used as the natural step, uh, which gives you a little bit of some guidelines how companies can really transform uh, their, their, their companies and their ambition uh, into, for a sustainable uh, world, <laughs> basically. Um, so, yeah, based on, actually based on that, um, the, this, how these workshops are looking at at the moment are based on a preparation day and then two, core, the two half days that are the core and a third day that is more optative. So it's, if anybody is familiar with uh, design sprints, it's, it's kind of like uh, inspired by, by those design sprints. So the idea is to, in a very short time, uh, work with a very much uh, lean approach, lean startup approach, uh, to uh, go from a motivation, understanding, having your, a big ambition on, on how your company could support uh, a, a sustainable economy, a circular economy. Uh, work on your baseline and from there start ideating uh, possible uh, uh, business models, um, decide on that, start building a short prototype that you would later uh, test with, with uh, real users, uh, mostly for example through interviews. So the idea is to really quickly, um, to, well, as, as they say, like um, fail quick, fail cheap, you know, um, and, uh, and hope assist on this process of, of innovation. And I'm planning on, on doing that with some companies in the, in the future. Uh, in terms of my segments, uh, I had two, two segments. One was the, with the Green Tech Cluster. I recently finished with them. It's um, a cluster of uh, com companies in the region of Styria focusing on, on, on green technologies mostly. Uh, and they provide support for research and development, innovation, and I was uh, working with them, learning about their innovation approach, and they also helped me develop this these workshops. Uh, it's been a 
a good experience and to get contacts to, to, uh, to real cases. Second, I'm going to start soon uh, uh, another segment with the uh, Saubermacher. It's the largest recycling company in, in Austria, very innovative and has a lot of impact in the, in the, throughout the region. Um, I'm going to be also uh, helping them in, 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 in defining some new business models that are about to implement right now. They're very circular. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to help them with that and hopefully I'm also going to use my workshops to work with them and also include them as, as a case study on my, on my research. Um, well, I did a short research say on, uh, on Utrecht University with uh, Professor Walter Vermeulen. Uh, it was a great experience, a great opportunity to, to discuss research with, with my peers. I was very effective in terms of, of uh, getting data, uh, collecting data with, uh, with other companies in the, in the Netherlands. I did six uh, interviews of, with six, six firms in only two weeks, so I was very successful, <laughs> I think. And I'm going back there in December to continue with those, those case studies. Um, maybe briefly, challenges I've come so far. Uh, first, uh, language barriers that I come across contacting companies in, in Austria or the different processes in Austria because I'm not at that, in, uh, my German is terrible. <laughs> I'm just learning, so I'm in the process of uh, getting that better. Uh, I don't know if other uh, colleagues have had that issue in, the, in their experiences also. Uh, well, balancing opportunities with family life is also a big issue for me. I, I'm a father of two kids. I recently, <laughs> the youngest one is only two months, so it's, uh, it's been traveling to, to take on all the opportunities uh, PhD experience uh, offers you and not being really taken to, to use them all. Like, for example, being to conferences, uh, I was not able to go to, to China conference where everybody went because of uh, what well, was the date of the birth, so <laughs> no way I was going. <laughs> And uh, something I need to work on are my facilitator skills for the design thinking workshops, and something is going to be work for sure. Um, potential collaborations besides um, uh, the second mens, um, something I maybe quickly mention I've been supporting an industrial symbiosis, a project on creating the first industrial symbiosis platform basically a network of companies in, uh, in Chile. I've been assisting them and it's been a great experience to get also uh, practice knowledge. And thanks to that also, I, I got in contact with many other industrial symbiosis projects throughout Europe. That was very interesting. If someone is interested in that, we can talk about it. Um, I'm also been a lot in contact with uh, two consultancy firms that work on innovation and design thinking in Chile. They've been also supporting me both for my workshops. Um, that's also a nice experience is if anybody needs something. And of course, all the practitioners and academics that I've uh, met in, in different conferences and through the case studies, I think that's also potential collaborations could appear over, over there. Um, well, dissemination, I don't have results to publish to date, <laughs> so I, I don't have any pub uh, published papers. It's, that's all on, on work. And I haven't been to academic conferences, so no much on that side. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks and open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> uh, we still have some time for questions. Oh. Hi, Thomas. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I remember you attended a conference in Slovenia. So I'm wondering, yeah, you said you didn't attend any academic conferences, but I'm wondering what kind of stakeholders uh, were attending there as well. I think you went with Aidan at some point, right? more in those kind of uh, activities to, to have a, a broader impact on, on our research. I think that's, that I, I personally think that it's not been discussed, discussed so much uh, within our workshops or our work, like how can we really impact beyond our, uh, our papers, yeah. Christoph. 
Thank you. Uh, based on your experience with design thinking, just in a nutshell, mm -hmm. what do you think are the main strengths or advantages of this method, but also what are the main weaknesses or limitations in a creative process? Mm -hmm. Don't, don't, yeah, don't speak so. <laughs> don't touch. <laughs> yeah, it's working. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, very, very good question. I think that's, there's a lot going on around this and thinking uh, lately. Um, I believe the main, uh, the main strength is, 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 is that it, it's, it gives you some guidelines uh, for an innovative process that it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's been proved that the, the results it, it can give uh, through a, 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 an innovation process. And it's something that gives you basic guidelines that anybody not being experienced with innovation or designing can use. Uh, I think that's, that's very valuable. Any, based on a few guidelines, it's, it's, it's a simple way of uh, working. Um, particularly, um, I think it, it's very valuable for companies in the sense that uh, it can save a lot of money because it, it really allows you to to work with a more lean startup approach to very early work on a test experiment or prototype and work on that and test it with real users very quickly um, so yeah I mean I think that I think that's that's the main thing uh, and in terms of weakness um, uh, well, I'll have to think more about it, <laughs> but I think it, well, it's, it's, it, it does require a little bit of fa facilitation, maybe. If, if, even though it's, anybody can use it, it requires facilitation, so, so uh, to be able to use it on any company, you need a little bit of training on this simple process, but once you get that, you can involve teams anywhere, so, yeah. Hmm. On, top, on top of this question, mm -hmm. on this way, uh, you already identified other pa related papers that also used that method, design thinking, mm -hmm. to, well, to, to a similar approach. Mm -hmm. if, if I have? Yes. Yeah, 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 I, I have found that. I mean, that's where I initially got the, the inspiration. I found, for example, um, uh, a methodology versus also using design thinking to work on workshops and use that as a data collection method to develop a sustainable business model innovation framework uh, that yeah, for example. And I've also seen that it's been used in, in I mean, it's been used very, uh, a lot in, in terms of product design, but it's recently starting to be used much more in business model innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe, maybe adding up on this, um, how did, why did you choose these two methods of uh, design thinking and the FSST? Yeah. Uh, I, I was, I combined design thinking with, with, the, with FSSD or the natural step because um, design thinking, the starting point of design thinking, design thinking regularly is, um, is um, consumer, consumer needs. And I believe that if you really want to make a transformative change uh, in, a, in a company, you need something bigger, not just, oh, that this is what my consumer needs and may maybe we find something around it and we make it better, but you need to aim big. You need to have a really ambitious goal, and that's all what the natural step is about. It's about having a very ambitious goal uh, framed by, sus by some sustainability principles that really tell you, all right, this is how big you can go, but in a sustainable world. So it really gives you um, a the natural stem, I'm mostly using the idea of it to, for the inspiration part of the design thinking. Mm -hmm. um, not just to, to bring a consumer perspective, perspective but also uh, imagine how big of impact your company could have. Um, and maybe for the design thinking, you should look up the Hassel Plattner Institute. They are the leading ones in design thinking, and they offer courses as well. So maybe mm -hmm. that helps you. Nice. Uh, what's your name? Sorry? Hassel Plattner Institute. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. And we will have also a short course, as I said, in, on Thursday mm -hmm. afternoon. So you can also. And Guillermo is, a, is a really uh, is an expert, in fact, mm -hmm. in, in, that, in this topic. So let's move on. Thank you very much, Thank Tomas, you. for your presentation. You. Um, next presenter, Anna. Anna Diaz.
still in work package too. Hello, uh, my name is Ana Diaz, and yeah, thanks for attending my presentation. Um, yeah, the topic of my PhD research is called Sustainable Product Lifecycle Management in a Circular Economy, and yeah. This is the outline of the presentation, so I will start by yeah, showing you the progress of the research that I've been conducting in the last months, and also talking a little bit about the next steps. Um, I will also explain some collaboration experiences that I've had and contact with external organizations. And then also I will quickly talk about my research days and second men, challenges and dissemination methods and yeah, of the results. So basically, basically what I aim at doing is incorporating the principles of circular economy into product design. So basically how to make products that might fit into a circular economy. And I also want to understand what's the product lifecycle management role in this process. So basically I want to understand how uh, can we design products that fit into a circular economy but also come up with better sustainability outcomes. Um, this is the approach that I'm following. It's taken by the design research methodology. And yeah, it's composed by four different steps. So firstly, um, I've started with the research clarification uh, phase in which I had the chance to uh, yeah, decide the focus of my research and also uh, write my proposal. This was followed by a descriptive study, and the descriptive study has been um, what I've been working on in this first year. And the research methods have been based on uh, systematic literature review and also interviews. Um, so the purpose of this phase is to understand uh, the existing decision-making methods and also the uh, predominant factors influencing in the phenomena of decision-making around product design and how to also assess the sustainability performance of products. And finally, what I aim at doing at the end of this descriptive study is having collected enough information in order to decide the focus of, my, of the tool implementation. Um, so yeah, the next step after this is to develop a tool that do, supports decision making in the sense that um, facilitates the process, but also makes sure that the sustainability outcomes of circular product design are better. Uh, for this, I aim at developing a decision-making tool, and also I aim at evaluating it. So I need to also develop a um, um, support plan, um, evaluation plan for the tool. And finally, in descriptive study two, I will be uh, evaluating the tool and also, yeah, drawing some conclusions on how it worked. So the, the deliverables so far have been, uh, yeah, finishing up the proposal of my PhD, which was completed by uh, January, and also wrote two conference papers. Uh, the ES, ESDRS one was more focused on the literature review and uh, showing the qualitative results. And I also wrote a conference paper for the Product Lifetimes and the Environment Conference, which uh, had just taken place last week. And it was more, I could also put in some insights from the interviews I conducted. So yeah, well, what I'm planning to do for the next months is to uh, analyze the interviews that I've had and also finish the round of interviews, so interviewing at least five more uh, companies. And then combining the insights from the literature review and the interviews, I aim at building a conceptual framework from which um, the development of the tool can be supported. Um, yeah, so the um, second man, um, my organization, um, of second man is iPoint Systems, which is an Austrian company that develops software um, for sustainability management in companies. So I aim at having industrial validation of this conceptual framework. framework. What I'm finding is that um, in PLM literature and in design literature, there's a bit of mismatch in between um, the content in the academic literature and then what happens in reality. So uh, for this, it's going to be very useful to collaborate with iPoint and, and so that they give me feedback on this conceptual framework and they assure that this is what happens in real life. And yeah, so I hope I can provide the conceptual framework ready by uh, end of February, beginning of May, and present it to you in the next Cresting Workshop. 
Uh, and also, yeah, I also had the chance to collaborate with some external organizations. Uh, I was participating in the program From Linear to Circular, organized by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And long story short, we were 40 participants, and then um, we had a six-week online collaboration phase, so we developed a circular economy project. Uh, which in our case it was based on coffee. So we decided to design a take bike system for coffee. And yeah, uh, because all the participants were from all over the place, the first phase was online, but then I also had the chance to go to London and have uh, three days of immersive workshop with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and also finish up the, the um, circular uh, design basically. And then, yeah, it's very nice that we were talking about uh, design thinking because we got uh, design uh, thinking workshops by IDEO um, and they were very useful in order to foster circular um, thinking and sort of more generate solutions that are aligned with the circular economy. But in my opinion, they were we were not provided with any support in terms of how sustainable uh, the solutions we were designing were. So it was very good in order to generate and brainstorm, but from my perspective, after applying it, um, yeah, I observed this little drawback. I, we were not sure if what we were doing was actually sustainable or not. And yeah, also we had the chance to attend some other lectures and attend the EMF summit, which had place in June as well. So yeah, it was very enriching to uh, be in this transdisciplinary uh, environment. And yeah, also because I've studied uh, corporate engagement so with the circular economy and most of the people were practitioners, so I had the chance to talk a lot with them and yeah, basically collect a lot of information on their views on the circular epo economy. And yeah, one of the things that I also was conflicted with is that some people there really saw the circular economy as a way of uh, generating profit. And that's a very different discourse from what at least me as a yeah, sustainability researcher, I think. So yeah, it really made me reflect on yeah, what should we expect from this parenting, uh, et cetera, and how like, can different views coexist. Um, yeah. Also, I had the chance to attend the summer school on design, uh, engineering design research. Um, it was organized by the Design uh, Society, it was super useful. Uh, I attended with Estefania and we were together with 30 uh, other design engineers. It was, uh, we, had a part, oops, we, we had a part of insight on design methodologies but more focused on engineering and another aspect of more um, yeah, refining our research, refining our research questions, uh, developing uh, reference models and impact diagrams, how to conduct a super through literature review, etc. And yeah, it was very useful also in terms of networking. We met a lot of people, very brilliant uh, researchers. Um, yeah, I also went to Troyes, so I also stayed in Troyes for a month and had the chance to conduct the interviews and also get some insights on PLM. I also had the chance to visit some like local companies and, and yeah, meet a lot of people, also do some funny informal activities. And yeah, uh, for the dissemination methods and results, yeah, I wrote two conference papers um, and I attended, so I presented three times in academic conferences. And yeah, also two practitioners approached me via LinkedIn and uh, interviewed me. Um, yeah. And also, yeah, I'm being active in LinkedIn and also in the new section of the Cresting website. And also, and this is an interesting thing that I think I can learn from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation colleagues is that they were very active in communicating. So one of the girls from my team actually sent the news in a Spanish newspaper and all of a sudden I was in the Spanish newspaper, which is a lesson to be learned. Um, I think, yeah, communicating is easier than we think and it's just a matter of implementing it in our, yeah the other tasks. Um, yeah, challenges or lessons learned. I think merging these long-term research objectives with the day-to-day -day tasks has been a challenge for me in the sense that you can be immersed into like the short term uh, and then forget about all the like long-term perspective of your research and then after three months you realize you haven't done anything uh, of your research and then yeah. 
Uh, also research data and stakeholder management. Um, I'm feeling very thankful to the interviewees that have uh, taken the time to talk to me. So I've been also reflecting on how to treat them well or what kind of relationship you're building with them so that they're not only objects of like in, from which you extract information, but you can also give something back. Uh, yeah, management of university bureaucracy, but yeah, this we cannot change. Uh, and also from networking to actual collaboration. So we've met a lot of people this summer, but for me it has been a challenge at this early phase of the PhD, being able to really set a collaboration in the sense that we are going to write a paper together, we are going to exchange data set. I really, like I haven't understood how this works. I think maybe it's too early for me, but yeah, I'm curious also about your experiences about this and also learning transdisciplinary and cross-cultural communication. So being able to discuss with people who have like different values than you and also come from different uh, cultures. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. One question here. Yeah, so at the design workshop, you were with a lot of engineers, you said. I think you're not an engineer by training, right? So mm -hmm. how was that for you to be in a training which is from actually for a dis different discipline? Mm -hmm. um, but what do you, are you referring to the idea of design thinking workshop from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation or the design research method? The design research methodology. Okay, how was it for me to be in such a... Surrounded by engineers. By engineers? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. I was not the only one. Uh, there were, yeah, I think five more people who had a background in sustainability but not engineering. Of course, I had to adapt to a new set of vocabulary like constructs, uh, objects, artifacts, whatever. Like it was, uh, it, yeah, it required a bit of like studying uh, quite a lot. But yeah, it was a great opportunity to also understand different um, thought processes, uh, like thinking processes. Maybe not so, I think as sustainability, uh, like researchers would tend to evaluate, like be very descriptive, but maybe they were more, more prescri prescriptive and yeah, more, yeah. Interesting. Hi Anna. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so just a quick question, but I, I guess like the, the answer should be like short, I guess. It's um, the, like how do you apply transdisciplinarity to your topic? Yeah, um, yeah. so far in this descriptive phase, I haven't applied it. So it's been based on literature review and um, uh, interviews. I'm not sure whether industrial validation is like can be considered a form of transdisciplinarity and yeah maybe that depends on the extent to which the tool which is the solution that I'm trying to propose is being used maybe by iPoint at the end which would have meant that it's more like a transdisciplinary process and has been developed like in a collaborative way or uh, I take total ownership of that and it just ends up in an academic paper. I like really for me um, I, I really, it, it will be an, more like an opportunistic process rather than um, a plan, I think. Okay. Um, while you were talking, I was reading your slides and I was triggered a little bit by two, well, one bullet point there, which said uh, system thinking is not yeah. system science and what was the other transdisciplinarity yes. thinking yes. is not sustainability science. Could you yes. elaborate yes. a bit on that and also give us uh, some thoughts on what it actually then implies for your own work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I don't have a clear uh, answer to this because it's something I'm dealing with it myself. But um, yeah, there seems to be a soft, so that's my interpretation. There seems to be a soft approach to a very hard science. And for me, I saw this parallelism while I was attending the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and then attending the design uh, engineering school. So basically the principles seem to be the same, but in the design thinking, only the sort of qualitative soft principles apply. But in the design sciences, the numbers are behind. You know, like you have to make your calculations, your equations, your optimizations, and the, all the 
the technical stuff. So it's very interesting because I think this design process is made accessible to a broad audience, uh, which they can successfully apply. But at the same time, if I am a, like an academic, I am wondering if these sort of more soft approaches, which again, I, I, I think they're soft, but maybe they're not, and I need more knowledge about that, are truly valid for me to produce knowledge. And this also applies to uh, system sciences and systems thinking, because we've also like, seen these uh, descriptive diagrams, but then there's also system science people who really um, are able to calculate the emissions of the system you are designing. And that doesn't always happen in design, uh, in systems thinking. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, yeah, the kind of, yeah, things that I'm reflecting about. I don't know, do you have any <laughs> position on that? <laughs> we'll discuss later. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Walter, Walter. Well, if I can give, give you an advice, then focus on circular economy based on economics, innovation, and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. The sustainability will follow automatically. The environmental and social impact will come from the shift to a circular economy, but the winners will be the most profitable, competitive, possibly global companies. And at the moment, I, I think the, 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 the capitalists, the hedge funds, the, the financial people are getting seriously interested in, and they only want money. But they will be the ones that push then really innovative solutions. Thank you, Walter. So thank you, Anna. The last, the last presentation in this section before the coffee break, and still in work package too, Stefania Delgadito, please, you can start. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Stefania Delgadillo, and I am part of the work package number two. I am based at the University of Technology of Troyes. Uh, my supervisors are Tatiana Reyes, my first Supervisor, my co-supervisor is uh, Rupert Baumgartner. And yeah, so my topic is the integration of territorial actors and sustainable product service system design for the circular economy. Um, yeah, it, it's a title that, that has evolved. It was uh, at the beginning just based in um, sustainable design and the integration of local resources for the circular economy. But I realized that it was very important to integrate the business models and the product design since early so that we can have uh, sustainable solutions. So I am missing a, a table of contents. <laughs> But um, I'm going to give you a, a very brief um, explanation of what my research is focused. So my main uh, research question is uh, how does the engagement of territorial stakeholders impact sustainable value creation? And this is in the cost context of sustainable product service system design. So um, this is uh, an, uh, it's, it's called an arc diagram, and uh, in, the, in the center you can see the aim of my research, which is to support the engagement of territorial stakeholders in product service system design to generate solutions that fosters uh, sustainable value creation. And in the right hand, or in the left hand side, uh, you can see that my area of contribution is uh, PSA design methods. And um, in the green areas, you can see the, the areas that uh, I feel that are essential 
for my research. So you can see that I have uh, other disciplines, not only design, but also management and business. And um, the ones that are in the bubbles that are lighter green are other disciplines that are used to, but are not, that are useful, but are not essential. So I am complementing uh, my research has an interdisciplinary focus. So I am using a lot of stakeholder theory because I am interested in the collaboration between the different actors that are designing and development, uh, the, developing a product service system. So I have uh, also capabilities, sustainable value creation, um, and stakeholder engagement, and social network theory. So the context, as I said before, is in the PSS design. So um, PSS design process models, as you can see here, I have a table you cannot see very clearly, but they are divided in the, usually from four to six uh, main phases. And the first phase is called the front end innovation where you hear uh, you have the value proposition, the market analysis, and uh, the concept design. And then there is the detailed design, the implementation, and the, uh, the use end of life. So I am focused in the front end innovation, so um, more into the value proposition and the concept design, because if uh, you want to co-create and collaborate with the stakeholders, you have to integrate them in early in the development of the solutions. So uh, my research is um, going in the three main axes, which is uh, sustainable value creation, stakeholder engagement, and capabilities. So um, for stakeholder engagement, it's a term that it is used by many disciplines such as management, development studies, corporate social responsibility. So um, in, in a few words, uh, I have uh, created like my own approach of what is for me stakeholder engagement and are the activities that integrate the internal, the external stakeholders and the peripheral stakeholders in the value creation and decision making and the design and development of a PSS projects. And these activities, they focus on uh, the system-wide benefits. And these uh, benefits are perceived in three different scales. So the first scale is the organizational scale and then the value network and then at the territorial scale. And these activities uh, enhance uh, trust and fairness. So for the capabilities, they also um, are uh, coming uh, from uh, different disciplines. We have first like the individual capabilities that were presented by SENT in the late 90s. And, um, but here uh, I am focused in the organizational capabilities and the uh, operational and dynamic ones, the collective capabilities and the territorial capabilities. And uh, for sustainable value creation, um, value creation, it's, uh, it's a process. And uh, in um, production engineering, usually um, the source of value is efficiency. And depending on the systems and the, the discipline that you are seeing value through is, is the source of value. For example, in, um, in economics, utility is the source of value. And uh, in psychology, the source of value is the perception, the behavior, the cognition, or the emotions. So what I'm really interested uh, about value creation, it is not only analyzing the different dimensions, but to, to get to know, and which is really important in production engineering, is to see the connections between these different systems, because uh, they have uh, this perception of value differently. And, um, and yeah, they're all connected. So uh, now I'm going to pass um, more on the activities that I have done during my research. So um, after February, 
uh, that we had the, the last uh, workshop in Utrecht. Um, I attended to the um, a conference on circular um, economies, you know, stakeholders in the circular economy from the European Commission with other colleagues uh, from the Crestin project, and we also met uh, Walter Style there. Um, and then um, I had other uh, activities. I had the opportunity to present my research as the Smart Colloquium, uh, which is um, it's from uh, the French network on uh, engineering and design, uh, where I presented uh, the, the framework that I've been developing for sustainable PSS design for the circular economy. We also, um, I also attended as an asset to the summer school in, um, on engineering and design research. I am also using the design research methodology. And um, yeah, it was divided in two parts. So the first was, was in June. And uh, before going there, I had my research day at Graz University, uh, where I was able to um, yeah, I, I didn't have like any special activities, but overall it was a very enriching experience to be able to, to share uh, thoughts and discussions with people that it's also working on the circular economy topic and uh, also sustainability. And, um, and yeah, I also had my evaluation by the scientific committee and um, from the first year. Uh, I went to China also with the um, Kressingers and um, I presented also um, about the topic of the integration of territorial resources and value creation and uh, circular product service systems. And uh, I was also able after the second uh, week of the summer school uh, to attend the international conference on engineering and design. And um, uh, yeah, from one of the outcomes of, of this uh, conference was a paper that was published in the proceedings of the conference. And um, yeah, after having a kind of VC summer, um, this month I've been able to wrap up like all of my learnings. <laughs> And um, yeah, so my next activities um, are going to be more focused in the finalization and validation of my research model with experts. Um, I'm also I'm having my second month uh, in Taiwan, in the Taiwan Circular Economy Network, uh, which uh, they are going to be the bridge for me to have a case study. And, um, and yeah, so from uh, November, I will start uh, like uh, the contact as soon as the, the case study design, it, it's like kind of settled um, just to be um, aligned with them, with the requirements that they might have. And, um, and yeah, so I'm going to go there. Uh, I'm planning to go in the, in the middle of uh, February. And um, then I'm going to have some like data analysis. And in June, I will uh, submit uh, my first conceptual paper where I'm going to present my framework and also the research, uh, some of the results from the case study. Uh, the challenges, um, yeah, the interdisciplinary research, narrowing down, like trying to learn from everything and then pulling it up all together, find the string, it, it's been kind of challenging. And I also feel that um, I was attending to a lot of conferences, even though it's, it's really good, it really breaks like the research flow and the progress that you can feel that you're having. So uh, yeah, so I have uh, made up my mind and I think I will assist the maximum to conference next year. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I also started, as I said before, conversations with the um, uh, Taiwan Circular Economy Network. And um, we already had um, a brainstorm of the companies that I might be working with. 
Um, yeah, a lot of them are into the mobility, but uh, there's also like air compressors, PSS, and also like circular housing. And yeah, for the dissemination, well, um, as Anna said, participated in the summer school um, with very talented researchers. And yeah, so a lot of them, uh, I don't know, yes, what? I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I also attended to the um, conference in design and engineering with, uh, with my research team from the University of Technology of Troyes. And um, it, was, it was very nice uh, to see also like a lot of the people that I met in the summer school presenting their work there. And, um, and yeah, here we are also in Brussels uh, with the Krestingers and ISERS. And I also have participated in some, uh, uh, some workshops from interest groups such as uh, collaborative design. <laughs> And um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much, Stefania. A uh, couple of questions, time for a couple of questions, and then we'll move to the coffee break. I know you're Keywords, hungry. Keywords, coffee break, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, <laughs> I'm <too>. sorry. <laughs> so, Andy. So I have a very difficult question. Okay. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> yeah. I, I was intrigued that you talk quite a lot about value. Yes. And uh, this is something we're grappling with, with Goska's project as well. So how much is the circular economy about materials? And how much is it about value circulating? Have you, are you going to focus on materials? and value, or are you going to focus on both, or either, or what do you think? A tough question. And I'm sorry about that, but you, don't, you can answer it in two years' time, if you like. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, but as I said before, um, and um, in the engineering and uh, in production engineering discipline, uh, value has been only about um, the material side and the efficiency. And um, I think that that's that's main of one of the main limitations of the circular economy, right? Is that everybody is talking about the material, the value of materials, but this uh, this also depends on other um, value systems, which uh, which I find that you really need to understand the connections among these value systems in order to to really um, enhance uh, and. Uh, the, the transition towards a sustainable economic system. In my definition, circular economy is about the use value of objects. And that includes cultural values, it includes the utili utilization value, <coughs> but it's primarily objects, because once at the end of the life, when the objects become materials, then it becomes a scientific problem. But the, the use value is a very mm, complex thing, and how to extend it is, is for me the big challenge. <laughs> yeah, I agree, and I mean like, Whenever we talk about value, we're talking about something that everybody talks about and no one really knows what it is. So, yeah, I think it's, it's very important to define it. And, and, of course, that's also the principle from product service systems, right? It's like, like extending this uh, like, uh, value in exchange to value in use. So, so yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stefania. Um, Thank you. A quick announcement. Um, 